Uh, so I will last talk this morning session from uh, Lauren Frank, and um, we tried to bring Lauren for many years too, and it's first time we have him during this meeting now. So his title of the talk, Memory Play in the Hippocampus, uh, what it is good for. I'd just like to mention that uh, one of my favorite of Lauren's work was about awake ripples, and um, we see them now in humans, what Eric just described, but I think that was um, uh, kind of... Um, uh, amazing result, and um, again, we looking forward for. We're happy to have Lauren here, and looking forward to his talk. Please. Thank you, Maxime, uh, and I wanted to thank all of the previous speakers for doing a beautiful job of introducing all of the various concepts that are critical to what I wanted to tell you about. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, thanks, John. Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, and I, I will, as is most often in a talk, I'm not going to answer this question, but I'm going to give you some hints as to what we think is might be going on. Um, and so this model, which I always include just for background, is something that Maxime and Eric and um, Lisa to some extent mentioned. I just want to go through it briefly in terms of how we think memories are created. Uh, this is just, again, a reminder of what you've already seen. This idea that whenever you're having an experience, you have inputs coming in through the senses, being processed through many stages of our sort of subcortical and cortical hierarchy, through a set of primary and then secondary and higher order cortical regions. Uh, these regions are thought to be plastic, but the idea is that at least for declarative memories, episodic memories, things that happen in daily life, these areas are, their plasticity is too slow to allow you to store those memories after a single pass. Um, and so that's useful in terms of maintaining processing stability, presumably, and having things look perceptually similar each time you see them. But it's problematic if you want to store memories for events that occur only once. And so, as Maxime mentioned, the thought is that there's this loop through the hippocampus, which is a site of very rapid plasticity, that during an experience, there's some encoding um, plasticity likely, you know, maybe at the inputs, likely within the hippocampus, probably between the hippocampus and the cortex, all of these sites that causes very fast synaptic changes that allow these memories to be encoded. And then subsequently, this means even if you've only seen something once, I can say something like, well, for those of you, for example, who are here for Maxime's talk, um, think about memory manifolds, right? And for those of you who are here, you can probably picture the, you know, the blue and the pink memory manifolds that Maxime showed. So what just happened, right? So you have a sensory input being processed through auditory cortex, superior temporal gyrus, all the regions that Eric mentioned, you know, were mapped in those human subjects so they could figure out what the language was. This presumably gets passed to the hippocampus, which then orchestrates this incredible retrieval. And the idea is that the hippocampus then helps the rest of the brain reactivate the concepts, the, you know, the sites, the visual sort of perception of those memory manifolds and everything else. One thing that's really important, and I think we all recognize for those, you know, if, you know, it's been a while for me, less time for maybe some of you, is we used to study stuff. Studying stuff is repeating it to yourself while you're awake because that helps you remember it. And there's a huge amount of evidence, oh, sorry about the phone in the background. There's a huge amount of evidence that retrieval is a form of memory storage, that the more often you retrieve something, the better you store it. And so in a way, this question of whether this loop is, you know, promoting only retrieval or whether the same time retrieval is happening, it can also be driving consolidation, I think is an open one. And so um, a secondary question, which I think also is related a lot to what Maxime and Eric both talked about is, you know, so we know that this loop can happen when we're awake, we can take away the sensory inputs, you can actually play them during sleep, but let's just take them away for the moment. We think of this loop in terms of consolidation. Um, but are these things happening in, you know, one state or the other, we don't know. And I also just wanted to point out, if you think about this loop and you think about the fact that, for example, we as humans don't sleep except at the end of our day, you can imagine it might be useful to have these loops going on all the time. And that's something that we've sort of looked at a lot is this question of how might this kind of activity, this replay that people have talked about actually be going on, what might it be doing? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So, for us, when we've tried to identify these patterns of activity, and this has already been introduced, but I just want to very briefly go through some of the things that we can imagine what we're looking for for these memory patterns. Um, and so one thing that's really important if we're thinking about something that might drive memory retrieval, memory consolidation, is that this, whatever this is, happens a lot faster than real life. 
So when I said, think about those memory manifolds, you didn't spend 30 minutes going through every moment of Maxime's talk in your head, assuming you saw it, you had this hopefully brief flash of what those things look like. And that's what makes memory useful, right? If it happened in real time, it would be completely useless for the most part. Um, we expect based on everything that we understand that this is activating patterns of hippocampal activity related to this past experience. We expect that whatever this is, it should be important for guiding behavior. Um, now, whether this is directly or indirectly, we don't know, but it should matter, right? If we're storing memories and those memories are important, this should be important. And then finally, related very much to you know, Eric's talk, this should be activating distributed representations that in this case, we might say are related to past experience. So I'm not gonna show any of this, but I'm just gonna mention, you know, we've been doing a lot of this work. I'm focusing on what we've done here, but lots of other people have contributed to this. So what does it look like? What, what are patterns of activity? What do they look like that sort of might meet all of these criteria for something that might be fundamental to these memory processes? Um, so as many of you know, one of the things we do in my lab is large scale recordings from hippocampus and now increasingly all over neocortex and subcortical areas. This is an example of what you see in hippocampus, which is what I'm going to focus on today. So on the right here is a top down view of one of our W shaped tracks. This is the animal and the location where it is. And you will see and hear the activity of 46 simultaneously recorded hippocampal place cells as the animal runs on this trajectory, right? I hope you can hear this. So the animal turns, we've arranged this. So the cells you see they're active in this, what I think is quite beautiful spiking pattern where they indicate roughly where the animal is, or you can tell where the animal is. That spatial activity continues while the animal's still. And then something weird happens. All right, and this is the ripple that, you know, uh, has been talked about frequently already today. This is a burst of spiking from a large number of hippocampal neurons. In this case, they cover basically the entire trajectory that the animal just executed. It's a very fast time compressed burst of activity. Um, these happen fairly frequently. This is obviously during waking. And so we've, as I mentioned, spend a lot of time along with other people in the field trying to understand what these events are and what they might be good for. So very briefly, and just as a review, these things are time compressed, right? That burst of activity activating spikes along the whole track occurred much more quickly than the animal's trajectory. Um, the original demonstration of sequential patterns was from Foster and Wilson. We showed that these patterns could activate one environment while the animal was in a different environment, very much like what we'd expect out of a memory related pattern. Lots of other studies have demonstrated that in that time. Um, we did the first interfer interference with awake ripples back in 2012. There was a beautiful paper from the Buzaki group where they both replicated our results and also lengthened ripples and were able to accelerate learning. So these events have been, the awake ripples have been tied to learning. They seem to accelerate learning. We still don't know why. Um, and that's part of what motivated us to look at this today. And then we've done lots of work along with a few other folks looking at this across structures. And this is very related to what Eric talked about. You know, we've seen coherent reactivation across hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, across accumbens, orbitofrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, again, accumbens and hippocampus. We see examples, evidence for a loop, um, again, from cortex, in this case, cortex to hippocampus to cortex during sleep. And this was auditory cortex. And we see lots of structure in these that segregates things like movement and immobility that seems to link specific hippocampal representations to general representations in prefrontal cortex and so on and so forth. So for us, this has kind of laid the foundation for saying, okay, these events are probably really important. Um, and now the question is, what do they actually do? Uh, you know, again, this comes back to the questions Eric was asking at the end of his talk, what are they good for? And these are again, the hippocampal ones. So, how does this content relate to behavior, right? We assume that it's the spiking activity of the neurons, the specific patterns of activity that actually drive something, but we don't know what. And they could do a lot of different things. You know, they could be consolidating memories during wake. They also have been proposed to guide behavior. Um, they could be doing, again, there's lots of possibilities, especially to the extent that these are retrievals of stored patterns of activity. So the problem is we don't really know. Um, manipulation studies, including ours, have really focused on sharp wave ripples themselves, not the specific spiking content. Um, the studies of content either didn't link it to behavior, they just said, look, there's this amazing content, or they come to different conclusions. So some of them say, look, you can kind of predict where the animal's gonna go a little bit. Others say, oh, look, you can predict where the animal just came from in some circumstances. Others say, you can predict what the animal did yesterday. 
um, or what the animal wants. So it's, it's very confusing um, at this point. And another issue here is that many of these studies have relied on simple, repetitive, or overtrained tasks. So it's kind of hard to sort out, is it past or future, if the animal's doing the same thing over and over again. All right. Also, and this is a general issue for our field, my work included, um, there is no clear distinction between a thing that is a ripple and a replay event and a thing that isn't. So all of us, again, myself, ourselves included, use an arbitrary threshold to say things that are bigger than this, we define as events. Things that are smaller than this event, we don't. And I don't mean that that means our work is wrong. It's just really important to recognize that we're working with arbitrary thresholds right now because for example, ripple power in the hippocampus has a long tail distribution. It's not bimodal. Um, and the upshot of that is we do the best we can, but we have to recognize that we're only approximating what the brain sees when we divide events as based on their sort of LFP content. So that's also something we've been trying to wrestle with. How do we get past that? How do we move to an area where we might understand these events, not just by their LFP patterns, but by their content? All right, and so that's what I'm going to tell you about briefly today. Some new approaches we've developed. First, analytical approaches for understanding the content of these events. What is it that the brain is replaying at any moment in time and what structure does it have? And then secondly, a new task developed by a postdoc in my laboratory that helps us figure out to a first approximation what's being replayed and therefore maybe get some insights into what replay might be useful for in these contexts. All right. So this is work by Eric De Novellis, a wonderful statistician, um, research scientist in my lab who really pushed forward uh, or pushed the algorithmic and code development. Um, I'll mention all of his code is available open source. It's on GitHub archives. So if anyone's interested in this, you can download all of the stuff that I'm talking about today. Um, and Anna Gillespie, a fantastic experimental and computational postdoc in my lab who really developed the experiment and has done the analyses I'll tell you about in the second part. Okay. So let's start with this analytical framework. Um, we're using what's called a state space model. And I'm gonna do something that I usually tell people not to do, which is to show some math. And I'm showing some math because there are people here, Maxime, Terry, perhaps a few others, you know, Eric, John, you might you know, appreciate this, I don't know, who like to see the math. So for those of you who don't, shut off your brain for 45 seconds and then come back. So briefly, how do we get representation from neural activity? Well, what we typically do is in this case, we decode it. And the way we've done this up to this point was to say, okay, look, what we're interested in is knowing in this case, where is the animal? Because the rat hippocampus cares a lot about position given the spiking of a bunch of cells over time. And thanks to Bayes rule, we can say, well, look, that's gonna be related to the probability of the spiking given the locations. And then we have this thing, which is basically in a way of incorporating information from the past time point. So if we know what our guess of where the animal was at the last time point is, we can ask, where is it likely to be now? And then that means we can take the last decoded input, put that into this state transition matrix, and then incorporate both this old information and the new spiking information to get our new update. And that's sort of, from my perspective, what our state of the art at least has been for doing this decoding. The advantage of this approach is we can decode in one millisecond bins. So we don't have to chunk up space. We can use this combination of old and new to decode continuously on any time frame. The disadvantage is that you have to specify the state transition. So you have to say, here are the ways in which the decoded representation is allowed to move. And so there we're building in some assumptions. What we've done that here is to say, can we relax those assumptions? Can we build something with multiple state transitions to allow things to move in different ways? And it turns out you can. So you can write down the math. This is what it looks like. The main difference here is we have this indicator variable, which is a latent discrete state for the aficionados, which says, how is this memory, how is this spatial activity moving in the brain? And specifically here, we wrote down three possible models. It could be moving continuously. That's often how people think about replay is a trajectory that is played out over space where the animal goes from one place to another. The challenge with assuming that everything is a trajectory is all of us can think about places, right? We can think about being in our office or being in our kitchen at home. We don't have to think about getting there at high speed. So can our rats do that? Well, it hasn't been quite clear. So we also wanted to include a stationary state where the animals could just like reactivate a place. And then finally, maybe the replay doesn't make sense at all. So maybe it has no interpretable or a fragmented structure where it's jumping around. 
And so the nice thing is that we can build a model that actually lets us not only estimate how things are moving, but what their underlying dynamic is. And this dynamic is estimated from the data itself. Um, and so for us, this turns out to provide a really powerful way of trying to understand what all the different patterns of spiking we see. So let me just illustrate this on some simulated data to give you a little bit of intuition. So let's imagine that we had 19 place cells active along a linear track, and these are their sort of firing rates over time. And now we're going to, or firing rates over space, excuse me. And now we're going to just plot some spiking of those cells that might have very different patterns in it. So here's the spike train. This is maybe a couple hundred milliseconds of activity. So here you can see that cell 19 and cell 1 are active similarly. This looks like fragmented activity because these are different place cells being active. Maybe the animal would be thinking about some other environment that had a different map. Here, however, we see a very stable activation of one place, stable activation of another place, a continuous transition like most hippocampal replay events that people have looked at in the field, and then back to this. And so the question is, can our model, without knowing how we built this spike train, recover all of this? Um, and the answer is, it can. So this is the probability of different movement states that the model estimates from the data. And you see it's first fragmented, then it switches to this continuous state, a brief fragmented moment as the continuous state jumps, back to the continuous state, sorry, back to the stationary state, then a continuous state here, which is the smooth movement over time, and then fragmented. And then we can take all of these models together and get a sort of probability of this latent variable, the position, where we would say, look, looks like a mess here. We don't know what's going on. Then it looks like a beautiful location, jumps to another location, smoothly transitions, and then is messy again. And so what I like about this is it gives us a really powerful sort of microscope for looking at these patterns of activity and asking which ones make sense, which ones don't make sense to us given our current model, and how are they moving when they do this. And it turns out that when you have a model that has this flexibility in it, you start seeing things in the data that you didn't see before. So I'm just going to show you examples of those in a few movies. So here is that a W track, like you showed. The magenta dot here is where the animal actually is. The green is our estimate of its internal latent position. And this is about a 200 millisecond chunk of time. And so what you'll see here, this is a classic replay event. The activity moves smoothly away from the animal towards this. And you see that the dynamic here is purely continuous. All right, this is what most of the field has focused on up to this time of these very smooth, beautiful events because they're gorgeous, right? Like that looks like the animal mentally replaying out, in this case, what it should do next. But now that we see this and we don't have to have it, for example, continually increase or decrease, we can see things like this other event. So here it goes out and then it pauses for about 50 milliseconds and then it comes back. Now the animal could actually do that, but our previous ways of identifying this event would have thrown this out as non-significant. Here's another one. Um, here we have the animal jumping, holding still in its brain, right? I mean, the representation, then it jumps again to another place and stays there. And again, like all of us can kind of do that in our brains. Um, and this is what it looks like as best we can say that the rat's brain is doing is literally jumping to representations of distant places. And then finally, there's some like this one, which make basically no sense at all. All right. So I don't know how well you can see the movie with it, but basically it, you know, it jumps, it hovers, it has a lot of mess in it. Um, and again, what's nice about this is it suggests that our model of what's ever going on, we just don't know. Right. And this gives us the opportunity to ask, maybe the animal's thinking about its home cage here. Maybe it's thinking about something else, or maybe it really is incoherent. But now we have a way of identifying that potentially. Okay, so given this model, we can ask, well, what does this tell us about these events? And here I just want to remind people for, or tell people who don't know this field, typically what we've done, as I said, is focus on these continuous events. And we've said, look, there's somewhere between 10 and 45% of them that are significant events. And then the rest kind of get more or less ignored. What we see here is with this approach, when we classify things based on the dynamic or a combination of dynamics, so this is stationary, stationary continuous mixtures, continuous or mixtures that contain fragmented, we can classify the majority of events. So most of the events sort of make sense in this way. Of those that make sense, the vast majority are spatially coherent, right? So they're not fragmented. And so that's really nice. It suggests that the brain might be doing something that's meaningful in these awake events. But 
only uh, less than 50% of them are this purely continuous category that we'd really focus on as a field. Um, and in fact, when we ask, well, what are all these other events, right? And these are, these tend to be, as I'll show you, high speed events. These are, again, the classic hippocampal replay of zooming down the track at eight meters a second. Here's the example of all of the different kinds of events we see, and this gets complicated. So just focus here. The single largest category, 40% of them, are stationary continuous mixtures. That's where it's moving, but it's moving slowly. And I'll show you that in a moment. There's a lot of them that are stationary, and we reported on these before, just activation of what looks like a place. There's mixtures of these where it goes from one dynamic to the other. All right, so we can see all of this now. We can identify these, and now we can characterize these events. So I just wanted to point out a couple things. These mixtures all have reasonably long dynamics of about 60 milliseconds, 60 to 80, very similar to what Eric just told us is the human ripple dynamic. So that's kind of nice. Um, they stationary ones tend to mostly occur where the animal is. Now we're detecting these as sharp wave ripple events, so we don't have a criterion on their representation, but you can see lots of them are occurring elsewhere in the environment. The others, these other two sort of interpretable categories are in, often occurring on average distance far from the animal, just like we expect memory replay. And here's the key point, the average speed. So again, this is the single most prominent category. These average speeds are consistent with real world movement speeds of an animal. So this is one meter per second, right? So that's something an animal could really do. And what we get is you know, 60, 80, 100 milliseconds of activation of a trajectory that kind of looks like something the animal could actually do. And we hadn't, I hadn't known that that could happen, that the brain was doing this and it was doing it a lot because again, our analytical models weren't up to the task of identifying these events. Okay, so that's the first bit. So what we see is that the vast majority of these sharp wave ripples contain activity that we can interpret in the context of the animal's current spatial map. The ones that don't are still interesting, but that's not what we're focused on here. And the largest group contains representations that move at real world speeds. And so I really like the idea that the rats have a much more flexible representational capacity than we've given them credit for, right? Not just high speed movement, um, and I should go back here, sorry. What I didn't emphasize is these continuous ones are just like the continuous ones everyone else sees. They move around, um, you know, uh, they, they, sorry, the continuous ones, these are the continuous ones, moving around eight meters a second. So that's, again, totally consistent with the other stuff, but much faster than the majority. Okay, coming back to this, and that, you know, the, the, the rat brain can activate places or little movements through places at 30 or 40 or 50 centimeters a second much like our subjective experience of what we have when we do this. And so that, that is sort of comforting to me that they might have quite useful little memories. Okay, so given that, now we can go to this thing, can we develop a task and use it to try and understand what's being replayed? So when an animal has experiences, what gets prioritized for replay? And can that give us maybe insight into what's being you know, remembered, learned, and so on? All right. So this is again, all work by Anna Gillespie, a postdoc in my lab, and she developed this maze, which she called the sun god maze. Hopefully you can see why. Um, the idea is as follows. On every trial, the animal starts at home and pokes and gets a little bit of reward. Then it has to go to either this left or this right well, where it has to maintain a nose poke for a while. And the idea here is we're trying to impose a period before the animal has to make a decision so that we can sort of look at activity then. Then it has to go out to one of these after the, after this wait period, it gets a small reward, and then it has to go out to one of these eight arms. And there in those eight arms, it either gets a reward or it doesn't. And it has to keep doing this over and over until it finds the arm that gives reward. Then once it's found it, that will repeat for anywhere between four and 15 times, depending on where we are in the task and training. And then the arm switches again, right? So it has to basically search for a reward, find it, repeat its behavior, and then search. And so when you look at the trials, what this means is we can have periods. So here, for example, the animal's going to arm seven and the fill dot here means it's rewarded. It's rewarded. And then unbeknownst to the animal, the goal changes. It figures out no more goal. I need to search around. So it visits all of these arms until it finds the rewarded one. Here it loses that for a moment. Um, and then it goes back, loses it, but then sort of comes in. And then again, the goal changes. And so the advantage of this is that we can look at search phase where we, the animal doesn't know where it's supposed to go. We can look at repeat phase where it knows in theory where it's supposed to go. And we can ask, what is its brain replaying 
before it makes this, presumably, we think, before it makes the choice of where it's going next. Okay, we can do this across hundreds of trials each day. Um, so we have thousands of trials from each animal, which is lovely, so that we can really ask with some statistical power, what's going on? You know, what's going on as the animal searches? This is a particularly unlucky time, as you see, for this animal, because it took forever to find ARM3, and so on. All right. So with this new analytical framework, we can also decode all of the activity. I'm not going to focus on this today, but I'm just going to show you how we're representing it. So we're going to represent this in a simple linear space. So we'll have sort of a linear axis that's in the box. We just do that for convenience. And then each arm is a linear axis along the length of the arm. So this would be one time where the animal is running into the box, goes to the home well, runs to the weight wells, and then it runs out into arm four, where it either does or doesn't get a reward, and then it runs back. All right, and so that's what it looks like. These blue um, streaks are, I hope you can see them, are sharp wave ripples. And I'll show you now what it looks like when the animal's moving first, and then what some of these sharp wave ripples look like. All right. So this is the movement decode. Here's the theta rhythm that is ongoing while animals are doing this. Here the animal runs up. Um, you can see there's jaggedy structure here, particularly as the animal runs into arm four. That's well known. Those are called theta sequences. We can see them and actually identify them at very sort of high resolution with this decoding approach. Um, and then the animal goes out and so on. All right. And we can see lots of interesting activity here related to the animal's, you know, representations of possible places it could go, even though it's not there yet. All things that we've looked at, but not what we're focusing on today. Um, oh, and I should mention, this is also a clusterless mm -hmm. algorithm, which means that we're using all of the spiking data, not just data from clustered single units. That's all in the paper if people are interested. All right. Um, this is what one of the sharp wave ripples looks like. So here's the animal in the box. The representation goes out away from the animal over 100, 200 milliseconds, then seems to hover in this sort of reward location, and then jumps back. Um, here's another one. Again, it goes out hovers there, comes back. And so we can look at now where, which arms are getting activated. So when the animal does this, is it thinking about where, or rep, sorry, thinking about is a terrible term. I should never say that. Is it, is the hippocampus representing the place it's gonna go, the place it came from, et cetera, et cetera. So what predictions can we make based on what we know? Well, if replay is biased to store memories for the immediate past, we might see where the animal just came from. Right? I need to know either I should go back there or I shouldn't go back there, depending on what happened. Um, if it instructs behavior, then we would expect it to preferentially replay the upcoming choice, right? And that, that should be the most common category. Um, or it could be something like, look, I found the goal. I'm going to now replay that goal so that I can remember it, right? Lots of possibilities. So what do we see? Well, what we can do is just ask in a very simple way, if we imagine that replay was a random, that it'd be one out of eight arms, we can sort of create shuffle distributions for how variable replay would be for each of the four animals. Um, one other thing I'll mention is we can do this animal by animal now, which is nice. So every animal is its own data set. Every animal can be analyzed independently. So here is future. Two of the animals show a statistically identifiable tendency to basically activate the place they're about to go. Oh, and this is during the search phase. Two of them don't. So whatever this is, maybe if you threw this together, you'd get a significant effect, but it's not consistent across the animals. Here's past. They are not thinking about where they just came from in the search phase, right? Now these are unrewarded past trials, but that seems to be actively reduced. And the thing that seems to be most common is the previous goal. That is the place that was rewarded, but is no longer rewarded. Right? So they're still visiting it occasionally. They're not getting rewards there. They used to get rewards there. And that is the thing, the one thing that they replay the most often. And we see the same thing in the repeat phase. Now here, the past, future, and goal are all similar because the animal's repeating for the most part. And previous goal is the thing that stands out. Now, this was a surprise to us, although it is consistent with some results from other studies. Um, one of the nice things is because every trial the animal goes to different places that have different combinations of past, future, goal, previous goal, is that we can create a, a sort of simple quantitative model of how these different factors affect what's being replayed. And so Anna did that, and here's what you get. 
So these are full changes. So these are basically beta coefficients in a sort of logistic, well, a Poisson GLM for the, again, the efficient autos, which tells you if something was the future, how much for this animal did that increase the probability of seeing it as replayed? And you see again, inconsistent things across the animals, but a weak effect, a strong, I would say negative effect of the past and a quite strong effect of previous goal during search. And we see something actually quite similar now during repeat, weak effects of the future that are actually consistent across these completely different sets of trials, suppression of the past, variable effect of current goal. These two animals started replaying the current goal sort of late into their current goal sessions. These two did not. And then strong activation of the previous goal, all right? Again, this is the place they shouldn't go to because that's not what the task demands, but it's the place they use to get reward. Okay, so in conclusion, because I've run out of time, um, replay often consists of representations that move at realistic speeds. We can get replay of lots of different arms during the track as well as local, but it doesn't look convincing to me at least that they're telling the animal where to go, right? I mean, it's, it's a weak effect of anything. And it seems to activate preferentially among all other things, representations of the previous goal. And here I wanna turn back to the point Maxime was making about the importance of sleep for avoiding catastrophic interference. Um, what I would argue here potentially is that this might be a manifestation of that very same thing, but during waking. So to the extent that you wanna remember stuff like, oh, that restaurant is closed now, but it's a really good place to eat. I don't wanna forget it while well, it's closed for remodeling for this month, right? You need a system that is going to selectively reinforce the important stuff, even while you go do other things. And I think that could be potentially very parallel to what Maxime was talking about in sleep, but this might be going on all the time during wake. Um, I'll also mention this is, you know, it suggests a role in maintaining rel representations of relevant locations, which is consistent with some other work from the Foster Lab and the Vandermeer Lab. And also this really nice theoretical paper on how replay might update value representations. Um, and so for us, at least, this is a step towards a quantitative account of what are these different factors and therefore what, what might this be doing? Um, and now the goal is to ask, what about the rest of the brain? Just you know, as Eric was, what's happening in these other places? So we can actually understand how this might be updating representations. All right, so I will stop there. Again, highlighting Eric, who really pushed forward, made these algorithms happen. This was also in collaboration with Uri Eden, a longtime colleague and friend at Boston University, and Anna. Um, and thank you for your attention. So I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you, Lauren. It's it's very very fascinating story, and thanks for mentioning manifold so many times. I hope not. <laughs> remember them um so we i know you need to leave at noon and uh, so we are going to start a discussion session and i'm going to pass microphone to terry who will be uh, moderating it uh, there are some questions uh, question and answers seen, yeah terry had to leave he'll be back this afternoon okay okay then i guess it's on my shoulders so <laughs> thank um, you um so there are some questions in uh, which I expect in the interior will help. I didn't look at them. So there are some questions uh, which I um, try to answer. And um, OK, I guess I will maybe just go in, in reverse order. And in fact, uh, uh, Lauren, since you live in soon, maybe um, uh, we can kind of release those questions. Can you see a question and answer? Can everybody see question and answers? Everybody who spoke this morning? Uh, so maybe we just in random order kind of try to pick up some of them and answer. For example, last question, we found uh, forward and reverse data sequences similar to one at all. I guess it's a question to Lauren. Um, Sorry, it's... which question? So I'm looking at, there's 14 open questions. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, I'm, that's not the last one. I mean, I, okay. I, oh, so. I uh... Randomly pick up one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just don't know which one you're reading. Uh, oh, oh, can you pick up your form found yeah. reverse and forward data sequences similar yeah. to Wang et al. Yes. Okay. So um, briefly, we looked at the data. We've seen a, two things. The first thing which is we've seen and published on is that we see some theta sequences where the first part of the theta sequence seems to represent current experience. And the second half seems to represent experience moving in the opposite direction as though the little brain had done a U-turn in this 120 millisecond chunk. We see that a lot. It's really strange, but it's very, very clearly there. Um, secondly, we went after that study was published to look at this clusterless decoding. And again, I just 
I love this because we can now, we can decode every moment in time and just look at it. And so indeed we see cases where it looks like the representation goes backwards. Um, there's just a huge variety actually. So some, some it you know, goes up and then it jumps back um, and then goes forward some, it goes up and then it sort of jumps back and goes backwards a little further and then comes up like a check mark shape. So we do see, we do see cases like where it's moving with all of those dynamics. Right. Um, so, so Eric, can you look at last question? It looks like specifically for you. Um, and, sure. and by the way, sure. uh, just to mention, so Lisa had to leave because um, again, it's Germany and it's too late. And, and second, um, it's, it's maybe a question focusing on specific uh, on particular speaker, but everybody uh, please jump in to, to comment uh, if, if, if you like that. So um, Eric, there is a question about hippocampus. Yeah, there, there's a few questions here. Um, <clears throat> one question was about whether high gamma and um, ripples are reversed in humans versus um, rodents. And um, I think the, the thing to remember is that we have a terminology problem. Uh, we uh, use um, uh, labels like uh, ripples or high gamma, uh, either in a, um, a sense of a particular band or in the sense of a, uh, uh, a thing. And uh, I think that we should use them as a thing. And so we shouldn't use um, something like high gamma as uh, for, for something that, that should be referred to as a thing. We need to think of, you know, we have um, spindles. We don't call them 14 hertzers. We have, we don't call them betas, you know, we call them spindles. And uh, the same thing, you know, with K complexes or slow oscillation. We, we really should avoid using high gamma uh, uh, as a, um, as, as for, for things. Um, the, the second uh, question was about ketamine and, you know, uh, I think one and, and why we don't, why it doesn't do consolidation or encoding, even though it has some waves, you know, you need lots of things. You need many, many things to encode or consolidate. I think that's, the lesson of, of many studies is that it is a, a, a clock-like mechanism that is, is the convergence of all of these uh, sleep waves and ripples and firing. So uh, any one of these gets screwed up and, and you don't consolidate worth a damn. And um, hey, Eric, uh, that's interesting. Eric, did I make a comment? Yeah. No, I'm kind of, Hi, Tom. Um, so Norm Weinberger was uh, looked into that um, because there were, were anecdotes that uh, people in their uh, general anesthesia who were very stressed going into surgery sometimes remembered the surgical procedure. Mm. And so he had uh, rats under barbiturates and he showed that they could do classical conditioning if you uh, jazzed up the adrenergic system, you know, so that they were a bit aroused going in. So yeah, there, there has to be a certain arousal component. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and, and classical conditioning, uh, as you know, can still occur after hippocampal um, uh, lesions. So uh, I think um, that the plasticity is all over the place in, in the nervous system. It's, it's, how, it's how it does everything. Um, so uh, if we're talking about declarative memories, the sort of things that, that Lauren was talking about and, and Maxime, this big manifold, I think that's a, a, a special thing that uh, requires special stuff. And very briefly, this other one about, you know, um, thalamus and rippling, I would just note that, you know, the human hippocamp, the human thalamus anyway, has uh, lots of uh, inhibitory endoneurons uh, locally. And it has uh, lots of uh, of channels, and and uh, it it doesn't have the recurrent um, connections that uh, exist in in um, uh, the cortex. So that is a problem. I, I will grant you that. But you don't have to have recurrent connections to get ripples. One question. Um, 
think I found particularly interesting. I'd like to ask it um, to the question to Lauren, I guess. Um, have you tried to apply this analysis to, uh, to sleep ripples? Yeah, no, it's a great question. We have not yet. Um, and the reason we have not is just a technical one. So in the rodent hippocampus, when you record during waking, you get on, let's say 40% of the identifiable cells are active. Um, and then if you continue to record into sleep, the other 60% appear. And so the challenge is that those don't have identifiable representations in the track. And so what we need is to be able to, um, and, and basically our current clusterless decoding will break if we do that because it doesn't separate out units that we're on versus not. So this is something we're actively interested in doing. Um, I will say the other thing that we're doing now is we've done a lot of continuous recordings 24 seven for 10 to 12 days from both hippocampus and neocortex. And so what we're hoping is that we can sample multiple environments, including the animals home, you know, resting areas, home cage and so on and so forth. And that we get you know, a representation for a large enough fraction of the cells that we could decode not just the current environment, but some other environment that the animal might be replaying at a given time. And if we have that, then doing that sort of sleep study is exactly what we want to do. But short answer, no, not yet. Uh, that will be, <clears throat> will be very interesting. So I answered some questions addressing, I guess, my talk in, in, in written. Just one thing I'd like to mention was a question about um, uh, sort of um, ripple-based replay happening for like 30 minutes and um, I mean, at least based on uh, rodents data and, and then it's kind of decaying. So um, uh, is it enough to kind of do a job between hippocampus and cortex? So one thing we found very interesting uh, when we do indexing uh, in the network and uh, like I described, uh, when we started, we have new memory kind of replaying at the beginning of upstate and uh, all the memories replaying in the later phase of upstate. But uh, if we keep doing indexing for too long, it's actually um, a new replay start to dominate. And um, in fact, there is optimal time about 2000 seconds. And I usually don't believe what is coming from the model because it's kind of, qualitative rather than quantitative, but um, 2,000 seconds is about 40 minutes. And if we do again indexing longer, then uh, all the memories start to decay because uh, again, uh, input from hippocampus starts to kind of uh, overwrite it and uh, upstate mostly starting to replay new memory. So maybe it makes sense that uh, hippocampus should kind of shut up and stop talking to cortex, stop teaching it, after a certain time, because otherwise um, that's kind of um, uh, interaction between all the new memories may, may not work that, that way anymore. Um, now going to, it was some question which I remember it before I start answering this one, but, oh yeah, was a question about, um, maybe it's to Eric, about high gamma and ripple bands are kind of swapped in a sense because ripples now around 85 and gamma, I'm not sure how we define high gamma, is it um, because, you mentioned something in a uh, range of hundreds. So um, it's a question from Megan. It seems the high gamma and ripple bands are swapped in a human compared with rodent literature. Is that right? So I, I, I tried to answer that before. I'm, I'm sorry, I was unclear. I, 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 I don't, I, I think basically ripples have uh, changed their frequency from rodents to, to humans from about 140 to about 85. And that's just for some reason we, nobody understands. And the high gamma is has been used in, in rodents to talk about 85 hertz, but it's also used in humans to talk about uh, you know very high frequencies that represent action potential firing. So uh, that's where the confusion comes from. I don't think there was any physiological swapping. There was just a shift in in the frequency of the ripple. I have a question for for Lauren and, and Maxime, if if I might ask it. Um, uh, and that is. Um, I'm really perplexed at um, what the ripple does. Uh, like, um, you know, it, it's this 80 hertz or 140 hertz, whatever it is. What, why is it needed or what's, what, you know, what, what does it actually do? It, it's a marker, which is fantastic, but how, how does it do it? What, what is special about that? I mean, I can take a stab at it, Maxi. Um, okay, so so no, briefly, please, yeah, I go, think, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Eric, I think the, the point you made is like, 
as scientists, as you're, as you're pointing out, it's really critical for us to distinguish the markers from the underlying events that might drive things. So a local field potential, maybe it could change in some complicated way, the firing of neurons around it. But it's, a, it's I think I tend to think of it as not quite epiphenomenal, but just a marker of stuff that's going on in the network that might be interesting. Um, and so then to the, then the way I would tend to think about this is, okay, so what pattern of say, let's call it spiking activity or synaptic input and spiking is a ripple, a marker of, and therefore why would you end up with spiking synaptic activity that at this frequency and what it's useful for? Um, so in the rodent hippocampus, the ripple is the single largest population event of all time. These, the big ones are more cells firing in a shorter period of time than we see during any other phase of behavior. The story has been that if you want to induce plasticity downstream, that's a really good way to do it because you're depolarizing the heck out of a lot of synapses. Um, and to the extent that you can integrate across the event, you might be able to sort of pull all of that stuff together into some coherent representation. Similarly, if you're broadcasting this really large signal out, say to multiple neocortical areas, you can imagine that you're setting up a really nice way to do intracortical plasticity, right? And this is the kind of the way people have thought a little bit about these consolidation models. Um, and so that's the story I tell in my head, but I think it's incredibly important to note, there's no proof for that, <laughs> right? No one has demonstrated a change in cortex as a result of ripples, right? So we don't understand what, what these activity patterns are doing or how the brain is actually evolving as a function of these activity patterns. Um, and then, you know, Maxime, over to you in terms of the models giving us insight into what, you know, what that might be. As long as I want to add, and it's not so much from model, uh, I think the point about this indexing and uh, this stuff uh, related to um, ideas from particular Bruce McNaughton and some others is, is maybe important in the sense that those events, uh, I mean, from my modern description, it did may sound like the hippocampus stores the whole memory and then whole memory maps to the cortex. It's just because we obviously simplified story to extreme. I mean, as uh, the right, better way probably to think about that is that cortex knows already a lot about pieces of the memories which kind of needs to be learned. So when that, that manifold, I'd like to repeat it one more time so for sure everybody remembers that. So, um, so um, we know what manifolds are. It's not like uh, in my talk, I really talk about that. Uh, and we know what red, blue dot sign, we know all that stuff and cortex knows them. So what may be that uh, event which was learned is how to connect those pieces, how to connect idea of manifolds with maybe idea of memory and so on. And this, this requires something very different from kind of uh, remembering whole memory and potentially, uh, again, we, we all, we, we, all the basics are in, in the cortex. We just learn how to connect dots sort of. So that's, that's why maybe, and I don't know why ripples what they are, but this why maybe they are doing that good job um, being very fast, very short and, uh, and precise and so on. That's kind of my addition. But I think it's great, great answer. And, uh, and why, I mean, I always fascinated why we have like, it may be simplified, these free structures and three so different rhythms, ripple spindles and slow waves, cortex thalamus, hippocampus, and it's kind of repeated across pieces and nicely organized. And uh, there is something behind it, which important. And we know if you break some of this, it's stopped working. So um, that's, that's really fascinating. And probably there is a reason again for, for frequencies being high and ripples being short and slow oscillation keep going on and, and so on. We just don't know all the answers yet. Yeah. Um, Okay, it was a question, um, if I understand it right, I think it's a question also to Lauren. So um, um, when you mentioned about previously rewarded location and uh, previous goal, um, so how you distinct between them in, in a sense yeah, of- it's a great question. So every trial, the animal goes to a, replays a particular arm. Um, and that arm can have one of multiple sets of characteristics, not necessarily unique, right? So it could be where it just came from. It could be where it's about to go to. It could be the previous goal, that is the place that was rewarded previously, but is not currently, or it could be the current goal. Um, and so you can think of that as a little sort of sets of ones and zeros, that it has some combination of zeros and ones for every trial. And so the nice thing about the simple regressions is you can throw all of that in. Um, 
And so you can say the previous rewarded location is a place that used to be rewarded, but the animal goes, if the animal goes there again, it's not rewarded. And that's different than the current goal because now if the animal goes there again, it is rewarded. So those two are distinguishable. Um, and indeed we see you know, different tendencies, but because we have all of these different combinations of trials where the animal makes mistakes in various complicated ways, we can kind of pull all of those things apart at least to a reasonable approximation with, with the math. I hope that answered it. Yeah. Um, let me ask a question. The question I think was addressed to me, but I, I only partially can try, but I think it's a question to everybody. So um, in my talk, I obviously try to argue that there are ripples which are good and important arriving at the right time, and there are kind of bad ripples which arrive in a different time and not useful, not useful much for anything. I mean, I didn't say it explicitly, but it did sound like that. Um, the, um, it was a question about what other ripples are doing. For example, those happen in the end of upstate and so on. And, I, I can a little bit start answering. We, we had the recent paper when it wasn't about plasticity. We just tried to see how ripples interact with slow waves. And we found that the ripples happening at the end of upstate can actually influence what happens with upstate. They can lead to the kind of termination in some ways or can extend them. So they're definitely doing something. But I think my general question is, I mean, we know ripples come in almost continuously. I mean, there's this peak at the all on, onset of down top transition is, is significant, but there are lots of ripple happening in other times. So what are those just uh, kind of wrong time, not doing anything good, or there is actually some, some use for them and so on. I, I don't know for answer for that, so maybe. Eric, you... Yeah, I'm happy to. So I guess just to complicate it even further, and Eric <coughs> mentioned this, um, you know, they're like, in, I didn't know that in the human it was sort of uh, sharp wave ripples versus spindle ripples. So that thank you for that. But in the rat, mm -hmm. like we've looked at ventral hippocampus versus dorsal hippocampus. Um, and during waking, their ripples are do not occur together, like basically mm -hmm. never. Um, they occur together occasionally during sleep. And that was something originally reported by the Patel a Patel paper from the Buzaki lab, which we replicated. Um, and um, there's basically the suggestion is that ripples can be local to one part of the hippocampus or they can traverse a good chunk of the hippocampus. And so then now it gets really complicated, right? Because those different parts of the hippocampus have different inputs and output loops through entorhinal cortex, which is are presumably engaging somewhat different subsets of neocortical regions. So my own bias is to think that it's all beautifully orchestrated to have the right information go to the right place at the right time. Um, but of course, that would just make it really pretty. I have no idea if that's true, but that's my guess. I could just add, uh, it's also true in humans that it's very, when, when we have an electrode in the posterior and anterior hippocampus, they very, very seldom uh, uh, occur together. And um, it is also the case that during sleep, the anterior, um, uh, you know, uh, sharp wave ripple occurs before the posterior um, uh, spindle ripple. And um, one thing that's really interesting about the spindle ripples is that they can occur on the top of each wave. So they can recur every, you know, um, 80 milliseconds as opposed to sharp wave ripples that, that only can occur every, you know, 5, 10, 20 seconds, which is makes a big difference for STDP. And uh, I, I think needs to be thought through in, in terms of how the hippocampus causes plasticity. And actually, if it's all right, let me just add, there was one other question about the proportion of significant replay events, which is also related to this, right? Is like, are these, are there a set of events that are really useful and then the rest are just crufty? Um, or, you know, is that maybe not the right way to think about it? And my own bias based on like the work we've done is to say that, you know, 80, 85% of the ones that we look at have interpretable spatial content. The problem is significant is the question is significant to whom? So significant to the experimenter is based on a model in our heads of what should the brain should be doing, right? And that's problematic because the brain may not respect our own internal thoughts about what it should be doing. Um, and so again, that's part of like our motivation for trying to get away from, hey, is this a significant line or is this a significant something else? And to say, how do we best understand this content and relate it to something else? My suspicion is that the vast majority of ripples are significant to the brain. Um, again, that's speculation though. Yeah, just to add to that, it kind of makes me think. Uh, there are a very interesting, I mean, series of 
more recent studies, which shows that actually cortex helps to define context of what is replayed in the hippocampus for this loop. So it's it's not like again in the model um, simplified model I showed like single memory and uh, single kind of everything and single upstate and so on. So there are multiple memories and. Uh, uh, they may be, I mean, they associated with different ripples and they can be replayed in hippocampus at different times and they can be talking to different parts of the cortex. So in a sense, uh, if hippocampal ripple happens out of phase with certain up to down transition in certain part of the cortex, maybe it's in phase with some, some other location where it's actually it's talking to. Uh, so in that sense, local, local ripple in the cortex may be more interesting to, to look at from that perspective uh, because they, potentially may be more relevant to local down to up transition and so on again. And down to up transition also not, not those global events, which I try to show there are lots of local down states and local down to up. So yeah, it's like, again, following what you said, there are lots of memories in the brain and they, I mean, they still replay it. It's consolidation takes time. So, uh, so we may just not be able to exactly identify what they're relevant to and, uh, um, I have just maybe one last question and I'm kind of desperately screaming, scrolling through the list to see what was, does anybody see a particular question? I, there's one on Neuralink, which I think is kind of fun, but you know, I don't want to, I don't want to. Yeah, anything. I mean, that's, yeah, I saw it too. At least I don't work on Neuralink, so it was part of the question, who's working on <laughs> it? But uh, yeah, so maybe Lauren, can you? Yeah, sure, um, I can say so. Neuralink does not collaborate with anyone. Um, yeah. it, just for my sake, I, we've been working on high density electrode stuff for a while. And much to my distress, many years ago, they hired away the polymer engineer we were working with at Lawrence Livermore Lab. So I have a particular negative feeling about them <laughs> in my own heart. Um, they, they have some impressive technology. They have never demonstrated that it lasts for a long time. Um, and so this is a question and it still has to be demonstrated. So I think just, I would just be careful of their PR statements versus the reality. So their electronics is beautiful. Their brain interface stuff, I have yet to be convinced it's going to be the wave of the future. Um, we do a lot of that work ourselves. We're actually hoping to be at 4,000 channels of recording in the next year in a rat. Um, it's very doable with these sort of soft polymer electrodes, um, but we will do our best to actually show it in a paper before we claim it. So, so my, my response would be that um, as far as understanding the brain, uh, uh, more is better. And um, as far as, uh, you know, uh, linking Elon Musk up with a computer and, you know, becoming the first bionic, whatever, um, that's something that I really, um, uh, uh, I guess it, it evokes horror, but um, not that much horror because I, I can't imagine it'll ever work because I, we have a brain that's been developed over you know, three billion years of evolution and all this screwing around with it, I, I mean, is kind of arrogant, I think, because you know, <laughs> we don't understand how it works and, and how are we going to influence you know, the hippocampus better than the neuronal cortex does. It, it just makes no sense to me. But um, uh, I'm sure uh, it's just because I'm old and crotchety. But um, anyway, that, that would be my response. Okay, I think it was great last question. So we are at noon and let's, let me thanks all the speakers and all participants. And uh, so let, let me close the morning session. I would like to start, I mean, we a bit late, but uh, let's start at normal time, 12.30 because somebody may be just coming for the time and, and, and so on. So we're all at home, most of us at least. So coffee and lunch is not that fun. Um, so, okay, so let's go back at 12.30. Thanks everybody again. And I think it was a fantastic session and very nice discussion. Okay. Lauren, oh, thank you. before okay. you, you, you bug out, can I ask you a question? Uh, everybody yeah. else can leave. I just want to uh, talk to Lauren for a second. Well, everyone oh, should sure. stay. I, to, I need to run soon, but Eric, go for it. No, it's Sorry. just, uh, go Sorry, ahead. Sorry, Eric, everyone should stay in this meet, in this webinar, even during the break, because We'll be picking it back up at 1230. Right. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, no, I, I just was was fascinated by the fact that they um, the, 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 the rats uh, ripples were mainly concerned with uh, the last one. And uh, there, there is quite a bit of, of um, old studies or some old studies where uh, 
they were trying to show that there was a competition between two memory systems, a hippocampal based and a non hippocampal based. And, um, you know, it would seem to me, you really got to remember um, what is no longer uh, works so you can inhibit it. And uh, th these studies, which were with lesions of the hippocampus, were showing, you know, better learning in some situations. Uh, and, and anyway, I, I, I just, I'm sure yeah. you're thinking in those No, directions. I agree. So this is this question of when, when, for example, the previous goal is replayed, right? You, one can have two models. One can, it could be, I am replaying this with the lack of reward association because I don't want to go there anymore. And I yeah. need to sort of damp down, like say I have a basal ganglia circuit that's driving me to there and I want to turn that down. That's one great, exactly as you're suggesting. It's a great possibility. The other is over evolutionary time, I know that places that were good are likely to be good again. And I better remember them be, so that tomorrow I can go back to my old foraging ground, right? And we can, I can make up a story either way. Our data suggests that, for example, in this case, the replay of that place, um, you know, the animals do visit it more. The replay of it continues long after they stop visiting it. So it's not, it's, it's not directly predictive of when they're going to stop going there. But of course, there's a lot of brain between the hippocampus and the feet that actually move the animal, right? So I don't know, and I'm happy with either model at the moment. <laughs> um, so take your pick, but it's a really great point, right? There are memories, so multiple memory systems. There are cortical areas that are sort of presumably deciding, whatever that means, mm -hmm. what, what memory system to pay attention to or what set of experiences to pay attention to. And I think until we have a full picture of how all that interacts, I think it's gonna be hard to figure out, you know, which of those models is right. Thank you for sticking for the moment. And yeah. uh, thank you for a fantastic talk. Oh, you too. This was yeah. fun. Thank you all. Thank you for the invitation, Maxime. I'm going to go grab lunch before I have to do the next thing. <laughs>